We all go through different chapters in our lives, some stranger than others. Welcome to Strange Chapters, where we bring you true stories of the strange, the macabre, the paranormal, and the supernatural. So sit back, relax, and let's get to this week's featured author and their stories. Hey everybody, welcome back to Strange Chapters. Thank you for tuning in today and joining us. And today we have some incredible stories from author Martin R. Shaw's book, Too Weird to be Fake. Martin's books are available on Amazon, Kindle, Barnes & Noble, and wherever fine books are sold. So if you're ready for these three crazy, incredible stories, sit back, relax, and let's get strange. Story 1. Out of This World Pancakes After a person meets an extraterrestrial, sometimes they are left with a gift. Usually this gift is a patch of missing memory, a mild case of radiation sickness, or a touch of anxiety, but sometimes the gift is a little more thoughtful and physical. Some have claimed to have received actual materials and technology from alien beings. These items, allegedly from inside UFOs and totally out of this world, are usually found to be entirely possible to create on Earth. Skeptics say this is proof that these items are forgeries and hoaxes, while believers say it's perfectly reasonable to assume that extraterrestrials would be working with the same compounds and elements that we are. Either way, receiving a physical item from an alien is certainly an interesting concept and adds a whole new level to a person's close encounter. Sometimes, though, the gift they give us is stranger than memory loss or supposed metamaterial. Sometimes the gift is so bizarre that you cannot help but believe it. For one man in Eagle River, Wisconsin, that gift was pancakes. At 11 a.m. on April 18, 1961, 60-year-old plumber and poultry farmer Joseph Simonton was sitting down for a late breakfast. His most important meal of the day was interrupted by a ruckus coming from outside. Fearing an escaped attempt by the chickens, he rushed to the window. What he saw was not a feathery jailbreak. What he saw was a chrome flying saucer hovering over his backyard. Simonton watched it in awe as it slowly descended and landed. Some people may have feared an impending abduction or even a full-blown invasion. But like most farmers, Joseph was a practical man. He wasn't afraid of this UFO that had just parked on his property. He was just curious about it. He stepped out into his backyard to investigate. As he approached the 4-meter tall, 10-meter wide, silvery saucer, a hatch opened on its hole. Joseph wandered on over to have a good look inside. What he saw inside the craft was not alien penguins, extraterrestrial jelly, or intergalactic goblins. It wasn't even small gray guys with big heads or black eyes. It was three entirely normal-looking, olive-skinned men in tight blue jumpsuits with turtlenecks and helmets on their heads. Joseph said they looked Italian. Whether they had the accent to match this is unknown, as these euphonauts stayed entirely silent. This mutinous seemed not to be by choice, though, as they did try to communicate with Joseph. They just couldn't do it verbally. One of the craft's occupants leaned out of the hatch and silently greeted Joseph. This Italian, Italian alien, was holding a large jug and was motioning with it. It didn't take Joseph long to deduce that this new tight-clothed friend wanted him to fill the jug. With water, he assumed. Being the kind, salt-of-the-earth man that he was, Joseph obliged. He took the jug to a nearby pump and filled it with some nice, clean H2O. He lugged it back to the saucer and handed it to the patiently waiting humanoid. As he handed the jug back, Joseph got a better look at the interior of the UFO. One of the three saucer people was busy working on some sort of dashboard. The second looked like it was getting ready to cook over a grill that curiously had no flame. The third took the newly filled water jug back and then gave Joseph a little treat for his troubles. He handed him four items that Joseph could only compare to pancakes. They were each 45 inches long, oval, crispy, and full of tiny holes. As Joseph stared at these odd objects, the hatch closed, the UFO rose into the sky, and it flew off. He looked back to the four pancakes, and they did not exactly look appetizing. They looked like, and I hope I don't fit any extraterrestrial chefs that may be reading this, giant scabs. He decided, though, that it would be rude to not at least try one. He took a bite, and it wasn't great. Joseph described it as tasting like cardboard. The aliens should, maybe, have offered him some syrup to go along with them. Joseph would have been quite happy to have left the whole strange situation there, but neighbors actually saw the UFO take off and phoned the Air Force. When they came to investigate and asked Joseph if he had seen anything unusual, they were quite surprised to hear that not only had he seen the aluminum dome craft, not only had it landed on its farm, not only had he met its occupants, but he had received some crunchy pancakes from them. The Air Force decided that this was out of their wheelhouse. They called in Project Blue Book. 
This organization was set up by the U.S. government to debunk these sorts of encounters, but its head, the legendary J. Allen Hynek, will become a true believer in the UFO phenomena. Hynek interviewed Joseph and believed a story. He was won over by his sincerity and Joseph's insistence that he knew no one would believe him, but he didn't care. He wasn't going to lie about his experience. So what happened to the three uneaten pancakes? One was given to a local judge who also believed Joseph's story. Another was given to Hynek and I'm sure was kept as prized possession. The final alien pancake was taken by the Food and Drug Administration for testing. These tests concluded that the ingredients used to make the pancakes were entirely terrestrial in origin. This came as a blow to those who were anticipating pancake batter mixed from substances from another galaxy, and is likely why the case was quickly dismissed. The story hit the news media, and they reported it with the level of seriousness you'd expect them to. A defeated Joseph would later say, If it happened again, I don't think I'd tell anybody about it. Did Joseph really receive some pancakes from three aliens hailing from planet Italy? As silly as the concept sounds, maybe. Could the commotion he heard that alerted him to the silver saucer's presence have been the sound of it breaking down or malfunctioning? Was it even a simple case of the craft running out of energy? Did they request water from him because they use it as a fuel source? If you'll remember, the men in black alluded to using seawater for a similar reason to Albert Bender. Maybe seawater and fresh water can both be used. Maybe it's like diesel and petrol. As for pancakes, is it so crazy to believe that they would be made from earthly ingredients? If the aliens were here to investigate our planet, wouldn't they use what they found here as a food source rather than packing an entire pantry until they're relatively small craft? Maybe the eggs in the pancakes were from Joseph's own chickens. Joseph Simonton was not a man given to flights of fancy and tall tales. In fact, the judge who was given one of the pancakes knew Joseph and vouched for his integrity, honesty, and strength of character. He had nothing to gain from his story. He simply told his story because he felt it was the right thing to do. Sadly, in telling his story, he was subjected to ridicule by many. Ridicule to the extent that he regretted ever speaking up in the first place. It's this reaction that means we may never know if Joseph's muted friends ever came back for seconds. Story 2 Sam the Sandown Clown Clowns, though meant to bring entertainment and joy, are a source of terror to many. Cholerophobia, the fear of clowns, is one of the most common phobias in the world today, but it's hard to pinpoint exactly why. Does the face paint, giant nose, and wild hair conjure feelings of something otherworldly, something humanoid but not quite human? Is it the erratic nature of clowns that makes it untrustworthy? While it may be the case that the appearance and mannerisms of the clown triggers fear in people alone, The main culprit behind this phobia in the modern age is likely pop culture. Pennywise, the evil clown from Stephen King's novel It, and its subsequent TV and film adaptations, inspired fear across multiple generations. Anyone who was a child in the 1990s and visited a video shop can likely tell you how they were mentally scarred when they saw the VHS cover art for It, featuring a grease paint slathered Tim Curry ripping his way out of the box design with demonic hands. This fear was built upon by a parade of cinematic evil clowns that followed, from the silent slasher art from the Terrifier films to the chicken frying Captain Spaulding from House of a Thousand Corpses. In real life, clowns have been no less of a threat to our senses. In 2016, there was an epidemic of evil clown sightings in the UK, USA, and Canada. People began seeing creepy clowns in areas such as car parks, wooded areas, and even next to schools. Sometimes they just stood there, sometimes they were very animated. Sometimes they had balloons, sometimes they had knives. Some witnesses managed to get photos and videos of these clowns on their phones, and the phenomenon quickly exploded on social media. Soon, people from all over the world were reporting seeing clowns everywhere. It wasn't long before a sort of panic took hold. Several universities in America started clown hunts. Mobs were formed with the intention of hunting down a clown after a supposed sighting took place. On Halloween that year, some people allegedly went trick-or-treating armed for self-defense against these horrible harlequins. In the attempt to stem the tide of clowns and to stop anyone innocent from being hurt, fancy dress shops started to stop the sale of clown costumes. Bans on clown outfits and masks were put in place. The World Clown Association issued a statement claiming that this creepy clown epidemic had hurt the honest and hardworking everyday clowns, businesses, and income. Even the McDonald's mascot Ronald had to take a back seat until this new prejudice died down. Soon after 2016, the sighting started to dwindle, and people started to calm down and look at the whole thing rationally. Outside of a few photos and video clips, there was no evidence to suggest that the clowns' encounters were nearly as vast and widespread as previously claimed. It's believed that the initial sighting started either as viral marketing for an upcoming horror movie, 
or just a simple internet prank. Soon a few copycats were inspired and their own antics made it onto the internet, probably captured on the phones of friends and on the joke and not terrified bystanders as they claimed. This caused the clown sightings to grow. More people got involved reporting unsubstantiated sightings and throwing fuel onto the fire and before we knew it we had a clown epidemic that didn't really exist and a bluff fast food mascot that had to take a brief but involuntary redundancy. Although the media often referred to this as a killer clown epidemic or something similar, there were no verified reports that any clown had attacked anyone, let alone killed them. The fear of a real killer clown came much earlier than 2016. In late 1978, serial killer John Wayne Gacy was apprehended and discovered to have killed at least 33 young men and boys. As if this wasn't horrific enough, when it was combined with one of his hobbies, it truly inspired nightmares. In his spare time, he liked to perform as his alter ego, Pogo the Clown. He performed at children's hospitals, charity events, parties, and even in parades. While he was entertaining friends, family, and his community with his clowning, he was also engaging some of the most horrific murders ever reported. Ever since this hobby was discovered by the media, he has been known by the infamous nickname, The Killer Clown. Whether fictional, rumored, or entirely real, clowns have scared us. But not all strange clowns have the intention of terrifying their observers. Sometimes their intentions are far more strange and unknowable. In the summer of 1973, on the Isle of Wight, two children had their own encounter with a clown, an encounter so bizarre and surreal that it cannot help but be believed. A boy and girl, both around seven years old, were on holiday in the seaside town of Sandown near Lake Common with their families. Though the lake was common, their day would not be. The pair were off by themselves playing and exploring the area at around 4 p.m. on a Tuesday. Suddenly, they heard an odd noise. They described it as a wailing sound, similar to an ambulance siren. This unexpected sound made them curious, and they decided to follow it and try to find its source. They followed the wailing across a golf course and towards a swampy meadow close to the rarely used Sandown Airport. As they reached this area, the sound suddenly stopped. The kids, now more curious than ever to find the source, reasoned that it must have been coming from within this marshland and decided to head on. They ventured deep into this marshy and boggy area and eventually came across an old wooden footbridge that crossed a brook. As they stepped onto this bridge, the unbelievable happened. The kids saw a hand wearing a blue glove reach up from underneath the bridge, a hand that had only three fingers. The owner of the hand then appeared from under, and it was no less strange. In fact, to the children, it looked a little bit like a clown. It was a humanoid in appearance. It was seven feet tall. It had no neck, and its head simply sat on its shoulders. It wore a yellow pointy hat with a round black knob or dial on it. The hat had antenna protruding from either side. It wore a green tunic with a red collar. What looked like pieces of wood stuck out from its sleeves and the bottom of its white trousers. As if this wasn't gesture-like enough, it was its face that really earned this creature the name, the Sundown Clown. It had blue triangle markings for eyes, a brown square for a nose, and yellow lips. Its face was extremely white with round black markings on its cheeks, and it had a fringe of red-brown hair that poked out of its yellow hat. The children were surprised to see such a strange-looking figure, but they felt no fear of it. The humanoid was carrying some sort of book and seemed to be struggling to keep a hold of it, understandably due to it only having three fingers. Sure enough, the book slipped from its hands and it landed in the brook below the bridge. The Sandown Clown quickly jumped back to retrieve its lost property. It fished around, found the book, and the kids watched as it hopped off to a small windowless metal hut nearby and entered. While this encounter would have been enough to send any adult, suffering from cholerophobia or not, running off the entire Isle of Wight, the kids, being kids, didn't realize how weird this was at all. They just thought, don't see that every day. With the clown gone, the children were confused and unsure of what to do. But not feeling afraid, they just slowly wandered off. When they got about 50 yards away from the bridge, the clown-like humanoid appeared again. This time, it was carrying something that looked like a black microphone with a white cable. As soon as the Sandown Clown reappeared, the wailing sound began again. Now, the strangest of what was happening had hit the kids, and they started to run away. When they had covered a small distance, the wailing stopped, and they heard a voice. A voice that sounded like it was right next to them, although it could not possibly have been. The voice asked, Hello, are you still there? The kids stopped running. They knew the voice belonged to the figure they were running from, probably being amplified by its microphone. They both decided that the voice sounded friendly enough and that it would be rude not to go back for a chat. Good old British manners. The kids turned around and walked back towards the figure, still understandably slightly nervous about the whole situation. When they were back in the sight of the clown, it produced a notebook, possibly the same book it dropped in the water earlier, and wrote in it. It held up what it had written, and it didn't make any sense. 
They were English words, but they were nonsense. The words were out of order and didn't form a coherent sentence. That was when the figure began pointing at the individual words with one of its three fingers, and the girl realized that it wanted her to read them in the order that it pointed at them. The girl read aloud as it pointed, Hello, and I am all colors, Sam. The kid exchanged confused looks and walked closer to Sam. As they got closer, Sam began to communicate verbally, which was easier than pointing at words in a book, but no less strange. When Sam spoke, his yellow lips did not move. His voice sounded muffled and was hard to understand. The kids began to ask Sam questions. They noticed that his clothes had some rips in them, so they asked why. Sam told them that they were only clothes that he owned. A bit rude to bring it up in the first place, in my opinion. With questions of fashion out of the way, the kids got down to the hard-hitting topics. Sam's strange appearance was not lost on them, and they wanted to know what he was. They asked, are you a man? Sam replied, matter-of-factly, no. They then asked, I'm sure with some nervousness, are you a ghost? Sam answered vaguely, not really, but I'm in an odd sort of way. The kids were confused and asked, what are you then? Sam gave a vague response, you know, and in a move reminiscent of David Lynch, refused to elaborate further. Sam also told the kids that there were more beings like him, but didn't give any information on where to find them. He alluded to being afraid humans would attack him, and being a pacifist, he would not fight back if they did. Now that everyone was good friends, Sam invited the kids to join him in his metal hut that they had seen earlier. They wandered back towards the bridge and followed Sam inside his home by crawling through a small flap. The hut had two levels. The ground floor had wooden furniture, an electric heater, and wallpaper that was decorated with a dial pattern. The first floor had less headroom with a metal floor. Sam proudly told the kids he had built the hut himself. The kids had some more questions for Sam. They wanted to know what he ate and drank. He told them that the water from the nearby brook was safe to drink after being cleaned. For food, he ate berries that he had foraged. He then gave the kids a little demonstration of the unexpected way he ate these berries. First, he put a berry in his ear. Then he moved his head in such a way that the berry disappeared from his ear and reappeared in his triangular eye. He then moved his head again, and the berry appeared in his yellow lips. Whether he ate like this all the time, or if he was just showing off for his new friends, is unknown. After half an hour, the kids decided it was time to head back to their families, and Sam graciously let them leave his hut. They headed back through the marshy area and onto the golf course. As they passed an adult, they told him that they had just seen a ghost. The man did not believe them. Perhaps it was this man's dismissal of the tale that kept the kids from telling anyone else about Sam for a few weeks. Three weeks after her encounter with the Sandown Clown, the young girl did tell her father the whole weird story. Her father was initially skeptical of his daughter's tale of meeting this strange clown figure just across the golf course from where they were holidaying, but her insistence that the story was real and her clear memory of all the details eventually started to win him over. He was even able to speak to the boy and found that his story matched up. After many retellings and questioning, in which the young girl's story did not change, her father became convinced that she and the boy did encounter something strange that day. He initially thought it was maybe just a person in a costume who was out to scare the kids. He quickly dismissed this theory, though, as creating an elaborate costume and building a metallic hut structure seemed like far too much effort for someone to go just for a prank. He decided to contact the British UFO Research Association, or Bufora for short. While it's easy to guess why he contacted Bufora, Sam did seem like sort of an alien. The reason may be a little bit more personal. The father had two strange experiences, himself in the years prior to his daughter meeting the Sandown Clown, experiences that may have made him well aware of the organization. Three years earlier, in October 1970, he had seen a UFO while driving, which followed him for some distance. Two years after that, while sitting on some cliffs at a bay, the father had seen a large pair of glowing yellow eyes looking up at him from the ocean. Could experiences with the supernatural run in the family? With these memories of alien crafts and saltwater monsters fresh in his mind, it's clear why he took his daughter's claim so seriously when others may have simply dismissed them as fantasy. It also explains why he might have had Bufora on speed dial. Bufora listened to the girl's story and her father's insistence that his daughter was not lying. They investigated the story of Sam but found little evidence. They searched the area but found no clown and no hut. No one in the area they questioned had ever seen or heard of anyone else seeing a bizarre robotic alien clown in the area. Despite the lack of physical evidence or witnesses, Before was convinced by the kid's story. In the January-February issue of Before a Journal in 1978, the story of Sam, the Sandown Clown, was finally shared with the world. A now iconic black-and-white drawing of Sam, based on the kid's description, made the cover, along with the eye-catching headline, Ghost or Spaceman. Sam has certainly stayed in the minds of many since he had his big cover story in 1978, 
But as well as inspiring fear, unjustly I'd say, he seemed pretty nice, he has also inspired a slew of theories that have tried to explain what exactly the two kids saw in the marshy meadow that day. Skeptics have said that Sam was simply a man in a costume. Much like the girl's father, Sam believers have countered with this question, why would someone do that? If it was simply a normal human being in a strange costume trying to freak out some kids, why go to this level of effort? Not to mention that Sam never tried to scare the children. The only time the kids felt scared was when he appeared the second time with his microphone device, but they did not say he tried to scare them. In fact, when he spoke to them with his microphone, they were so convinced he was nothing to fear that they went back to have a chinwag with him. Others have taken a darker view of Sam, believing he was a man in a suit, but he wasn't trying to scare the children. He was trying to abduct them. While a seven-foot-tall clown inviting two young kids into his makeshift hut in the woods certainly raises a number of red flags, Sam never acted threateningly. The kids enter Sam's home on their own free will and were allowed to leave when they wanted to without incident. Sam never showed any intention or desire to scare them or harm the kids in any way, shape, or form. And as Sam was simply a man in an elaborate costume, it doesn't explain the wailing sound that drew the kids to him in the first place. People who do not believe in a single piece of the Sandown Clown story claim the two kids were just making the whole thing up. They say the kids were likely bored and just wanted attention. If this were the case, why would the girl wait three whole weeks before telling her father? And after she began getting attention, and even getting interviewed by Bufora, why would she, and the young boy, remain anonymous to this day? After the story began getting attention in 1978, there must have been plenty of opportunities to do more interviews with UFO journals and even newspapers and TV shows, which likely would have been paid. But they did nothing. Attention may have been something the kids got after meeting Sam, but it doesn't seem like something they wanted. If Sam wasn't just a strange man in a costume, or a total fabrication, what else could he have been? Could Sam have been some sort of alien being? With a strange appearance and mannerisms, it seems an obvious conclusion to jump to. He doesn't resemble the traditional little green man we usually think of when we picture an extraterrestrial, but alien descriptions have run the gamut of bizarre experiences. From the very human-looking Nordic description of ETs, to the praying mantis resembling insectoids, aliens have been reported to look just like about anything you can imagine. Sometimes they have mandibles, claws, antennae, tentacles, and more features not typically found on your average, four-foot-high gray humanoid with black eyes from beyond the stars. Some aliens are even reported to be partially robotic, which some think could explain the Sandown Clown. Some believe that Sam could have been an alien that was also a cyborg. They believe that the strange marking on his clown suit, hat, and face were in fact dials and controls for his more mechanical parts, similar to Darth Vader's chest plate in the Star Wars movies. Could Sam have been a bionic bozo? Another theory suggests that Sam was indeed an alien, but was in a special suit, perhaps a suit that allowed the alien to survive on Earth, similar to one of our own astronauts in outer space. They also believe that the reason behind his odd face and motionless lips is because the face the kids were seeing was actually a helmet or mask. If this is the case, then who knows what manner of alien entity was inside that special suit that, unbeknownst to him, made him look a little bit like a circus clown. Some have suggested Sam was a ghost. It seems to be the conclusion that the kids came to, and Sam did not say he was one, but also that he wasn't. He wasn't very clear on that. Many disagree with this theory, arguing that Sam simply doesn't follow the same format as other tales of ghosts and specters, from appearing in broad daylight to looking like a robotic clown to having a metal hut for a home. Some say Sam simply doesn't fit into the world of ghosts. As for Sam claiming that he is a ghost in the odd sort of way, people believe that he was simply trying to make the kids understand something that was far beyond their capability by putting himself in the terms they could understand. Could Sam have been a creature not from another world, but from another dimension? Many authors on the paranormal and supernatural believe that there are places where there are terrors in our reality that lead to another dimension where UFOs, ghosts, and cryptids dwell and occasionally slip through. Could the young boy and girl have briefly stepped through into another dimension? Or did Sam slip through into ours? Was the wailing sound the noise of an interdimensional portal tearing open? Was the whale of sound beamed directly into the brains of the children to bring them Sam so he could study them and bring the data back to his dimension? When it comes to explaining what Sam was, the young girl's father may have been right from the very beginning. The father told Bifora that he believed his daughter and the boy had been taken into a bubble of alien reality. The Oz factor is a phrase coined by ufologist Jenny Randalls to describe the strange feeling many people who had experienced the unknown were reporting. Ufologists had noticed that in many reports of people encountering UFOs, extraterrestrials, and other strange beings, the experiencer described feeling displaced and isolated. 
They felt as if they were still on their own world, but somehow different. Like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, there were small but subtle and surreal differences. Time seemed to move differently. There was a feeling of weightlessness. No sound could be heard. No one else could be seen. Cats chased dogs. Some believe this effect is something caused, on purpose or as an unintentional side effect, by strange beings who enter our reality. Could Sam have sucked the kids into their own alien land of Oz? And what about the kids? Do they still remember their meeting with Sam all these years later? Did he have a lasting impact on their lives? Will they ever come forward and share their story again? As adults, maybe they understand what happened more clearly. Maybe they remember more details about what happened that day. Maybe they have a vital piece of information that could help us truly understand what Sam was. When the kids asked Sam quite directly what he was, and he replied with a very Lynchian, you know, what if he wasn't just being intentionally and annoyingly vague? What if Sam knew that the kids subconsciously understood exactly what he was? Maybe the two kids didn't even fully understand at the time, and certainly lacked the frames of reference and language skills necessary to convey to someone else exactly what the strange clown man was. Maybe it took years of mental processing for these kids to unlock the secret of the clown. But perhaps one day all the pieces fell into place and the kids finally understood. Is it possible that the kids, now both well into middle age, are out there somewhere right now, existing as the only two people on planet Earth who know the secret of Sam, the Sandown Clown? Despite the only witnesses being two seven-year-old children, their story of meeting a semi-robotic alien clown-looking humanoid on the Isle of Wight in 1973 has endured ever since and still captures the imagination of those who hear it. Surely this has something to do with the public's built-in fear of clowns, but it goes deeper than that. The young girl's father thought so, and so did Bufora when they investigated it. They thought, this is too weird to be fake. Story 3 Jeff the Talking Mongoose Talking animals are usually reserved for animated movies and their poor quality live-action remakes. But for a family on the Isle of Man in the 1930s, a talking animal became a strange reality. But this talking animal was no mere parrot imitating the vocal sounds made by humans. This wasn't even an animal that should be on the island. This talking animal was a small, furry mammal known as a mongoose. And this mongoose was called Jeff. The Irving family lived on the Isle of Man, a small island in the Irish Sea, in a modest-sized and isolated farmhouse. The family consisted of Father James, Mother Margaret, and daughter Vori. The Irvings lived in a very quiet and simple life until one day in September 1931, when the quiet was broken by a scratching and clawing sound coming from inside their walls. They thought that surely a rat had just gotten in there somehow, and soon left out traps to catch a sneaky rodent. The traps stayed empty, and the noises continued. As the days went on, the sound started to annoy and frustrate the family. James, in particular, was growing tired of the nuisance noises and decided to try a new tactic to get rid of the animal. He decided he was going to scare the creature so badly that it would flee the farmhouse altogether. He crept up to the wall, listened closely to where the sound was coming from, zeroed in on the animal's location, and let out a growl. He attempted to make this noise sound as much like it was coming from some sort of large predator as possible, thus terrifying the smaller animal into leaving and never coming back. James was quite shocked when, instead of hearing the sound of small feet running for their life, the animal on the wall growled back at him. The creature continued to live in their walls, and the noises it made started to get weirder. At points, the family thought the creature even sounded human, and described noises it made as being similar to a baby, like he was trying to talk but couldn't quite manage it. Having previously copied James's terrifying growl, the thing in the wall continued to show off its intimidation skills, like it was trying to talk but couldn't quite manage it. Having previously copied James's terrifying growl, the thing in the wall continued to show off its imitation skills. James would make various animal noises, such as bird calls, and the creature would repeat them. Even more impressive, the creature was able to remember these sounds. Before long, James could just say the name of an animal, and an impression of that animal would come from inside the walls. But animal impressions were just the beginning. 13-year-old Vori decided to teach whatever it was in the walls something too. She began to recite nursery rhymes and asked the creature to repeat them back. Much to the shock of her mother and father, it did. It repeated the rhymes back clearly in a high-pitched voice. Before too long, the creature had evolved past the point of mere imitation. It seemed to have somehow learned the English language. One day, the creature in the walls introduced itself to the Irving family. It told them that its name was Jeff and that he was an extra clever mongoose. He went on to let them know a little bit about himself. He informed them that he was born in India in 1852. With this introduction, the family began an unusual relationship with the talking mongoose. 
Things began happily enough, and Jeff even became like a fourth member of the Irving family. He moved out of the walls and into an alcove in the roof above Vory's bedroom. This little area they dubbed Jeff's Sanctum. During the days, Jeff would leave the farmhouse and wander the island. He picked up information here and there by listening into conversations and reading the local newspaper. At night, he returned back to the Irvings and told them all that he had learned on his day's journey. During this time when Jeff first joined the family, no one had really seen him. He'd make noise, talk to the family, and even leave Margaret rabbits that he caught, but catching a glimpse of Jeff proved difficult. It seemed almost as if he didn't want to be seen. James and Margaret caught quick glimpses of him on occasion, but it was Voiry who he seemed to be most comfortable being seen by. She would describe Jeff as being around the size of a rat, covered in yellow fur, with a long bushy tail that had black speckles on it. From this description, it was seen that Jeff's claims of being a mongoose were true, although it would later be claimed that Jeff also had tiny human hands, something that regular mongooses do not have. You would assume that living with a gossipy talking animal would be all fun and games, but Jeff was not the perfect house guest. For a start, Jeff gave the Irvings very little privacy. According to James, if you attempted to whisper anything, Jeff would loudly announce that he knew what you were saying, then would repeat what you just whispered. There were no more secrets when Jeff was around. He also had a temper. One morning when James was opening the mail, Jeff must have thought that he was taking his sweet time about it. He yelled out, Read it out loud, you fat-headed gnome! Another day, while Margaret made her way toward the house, she began getting pelted with stones. She knew exactly who was behind this attack and shouted out to Jeff, who called her a witch. Some days it seemed like Jeff's entire goal was to torment and annoy the family. When asked why he was behaving this way, he told them that he was doing it for the devilment. Before long, the Irvings' neighbors became aware of Jeff. Shockingly, some of them didn't instantly believe that the Irvings had a talking, exotic animal living in their walls and wanted proof. A trip to the Irving farmhouse soon convinced them that the family was not lying. They would talk to Jeff, and he would talk back. Some were even lucky enough to catch a quick glimpse of him. Eventually, word of Jeff reached the local newspaper and then reporters in England. Newspapers in the UK dubbed Jeff the Dalby Spook, named for the area on the Isle of Man where the farmhouse was located, and ran articles that didn't take the situation in the Irving home too seriously. These articles did catch the attention of Richard S. Lambert, editor of the Listener magazine, though. Richard decided to travel to the Isle of Man with the paranormal investigator Harry Price, who would later go on to investigate Borley Rectory, the most haunted house in England, to find out exactly what was going on at the Irving farmhouse. Jeff, usually friendly enough to visitors, was not pleased when he was told that Harry Price was coming to the house. Jeff reportedly said of Harry, he's a man who puts the kibosh on the spirits. Jeff seemed worried that Harry was coming to disprove his existence. As if in protest, when Richard and Harry arrived, Jeff stayed hidden. Uncharacteristically, Jeff even refused to talk or make any sound whatsoever. The Irving family were sure that Jeff was still around somewhere, and they tried to coax some sort of sound out of him, but he would give them nothing. Harry then tried to appeal to the mongoose, telling Jeff that they had come a long way just to meet him. Still, Jeff stayed silent. Richard and Harry left the island without proof. As soon as they were gone, Jeff reappeared. Jeff told James that he had gone on a short holiday while the visitors were in the area. He told them that he didn't want to meet Harry because he was a skeptic. James did manage to talk Jeff into making some plastic casts of his teeth and claws and leaving a lock of his hair. James sent these items to Richard and Harry and they quickly went about getting them tested. The cast of teeth and claws could not be identified by the Natural History Museum. The expert that examined them concluded they belonged to no animal that he knew of, but definitely did not belong to a mongoose. He did say these molds were possibly man-made, created by carving into the plaster with a stick. The hair sample likely belonged to a dog. The main suspect was the Irving family sheepdog, Mona. Richard and Henry would publish a book about Jeff in 1936, titled The Haunting Akashian's Gap. In this book, they spoke about Jeff, their investigation into him, and his residency in the Irving home. In the book, they remain fairly neutral and never say whether they believe in the Jeff phenomena or not. In private, though, it seemed that Harry considered the whole thing a hoax. Price wasn't the only investigator who came to visit Jeff. The amazingly named parapsychologist Nandor Fordor also came to see if he could conclude what Jeff was. The mongoose judged Nandor to not be worth performing for and stayed silent and hidden for the duration of his stay. Nandor was not as dismissive of Jeff's existence as Price, though. After speaking to the family and many other people who had seen or heard Jeff, he was convinced by their stories. Nandor was of the opinion that Jeff was in fact an actual real-life mongoose, a mongoose that had been accidentally possessed by a split-off part of Jim Irving's personality, created through the father's belief that he had failed in life and could not accept it. Nandor's harsh words, not mine. 
Having possessed a mongoose, it was then drawn back to its accidental crater to live in his walls and be an occasional nuisance. As believable as this explanation is, there is one hole in it. Where would a part of Jim's personality have found a mongoose to possess? This was the Isle of Man, after all. As it turns out, there may have actually been a mongoose or two on the island. Two decades before Jeff appeared, a local farmer had bought and released several of the creatures to keep rats at bay. Cats must have been scarce on the Isle of Man at the time. Could one of the mongooses have survived for 20 years? Could it have been wandering around a total normal animal until one day was suddenly possessed by a psychic manifestation that had broken off of Jim Irving? As the 1930s continued, Jeff appeared less and less of the Irving family. As the decade ended, he had all but disappeared. In 1945, James Irving died, and Margaret and Vory moved out of the farmhouse and off the island. Actor Leslie Graham bought the house soon after and claimed to have shot and killed Jeff. The animal he showed in pictures did not match the descriptions of the talking mongoose, though, and Vore later identified the animal pictured as not Jeff. Why he would want to shoot a beloved magical mongoose in the first place was anyone's guess, let alone why he'd be proud of it. Jeff never appeared to any future owners of the farmhouse or to any other residents of the Isle of Man. Until her death in 2005, Vore remained insistent that Jeff was real and was not a hoax. She seemed reluctant to discuss Jeff, even blaming the mongoose for why she couldn't find a husband after moving and never tried to make any money off the story. But when asked, she would still remain adamant that her family did play hostage to a strange and sometimes mischievous talking mongoose. What was Jeff? Was he a cryptid? A ghost? An actual mongoose that had somehow developed the ability to speak? And how did he come to stay in the Irving's farmhouse? Jeff seemed to have the abilities and characteristics of both a living creature and something like a phantom. He had a physical presence in the sense that he could make noise, throw stones, and interact with the environment around him. However, he also had the ability to appear and disappear at will. He could be invisible. He could listen into conversations in the house and elsewhere on the island without the participants ever knowing he was there. Because of these reasons and more, some people believe that Jeff was a poltergeist. Some believe that poltergeists are caused by, or at least attracted to, teenagers who are going through some sort of emotional problems. Due to this, many investigators have pointed to Vore as the reason Jeff appeared and took up residence in the Irving home. While Vori may not have had any obvious issues she was going through, she was a very isolated person. Outside of her parents, she didn't have a whole lot of company. Any friends her own age she did have, she would not have seen often due to the rural location of the farmhouse. Could a poltergeist have been attracted to Vore's loneliness? Possible, but poltergeists are usually more of a violent spirit. Jeff never seemed like he wanted to scare or harm the family. He was just a bit annoying sometimes. He did once tell the family that he could kill them all, but wouldn't but that seemed to be an isolated incident. Mostly, he seemed happy enough just living with the Irvings and occasionally being a pain in the ass. If Jeff wasn't a poltergeist, could he have been some sort of other ghost? According to the mongoose himself, yes, Jeff once said, I am a ghost in the form of a weasel. This seems to imply that Jeff was a spirit, but has chosen to appear as a small mammal. Why would he do this? I suppose it's less terrifying than having a full human apparition hiding in the walls and sleeping in your teenage daughter's bedroom. On other occasions, Jeff claimed to be an earthbound spirit, and not a spirit at all, arguing that he wouldn't be able to kill rabbits if he were a ghost. He sure was one confusing mongoose, and that might give us a hint as to what he really was. The Isle of Man, and particularly the area the Irving's farmhouse was on, was associated with the Fae. Fairies, imps, elves, gnomes, and more come under this heading. What they all have in common is their mischievous and trickster nature, a nature that is shared by our talking mongoose. According to legend, fae creatures could bring humans good or bad luck when they interacted with them. To win the favor of the fae, humans would leave out offerings of small trinkets, food, and drink. And the Irving family certainly left Jeff some offerings. When he moved into the alcove in Vore's room, they would leave him food. Bacon and chocolate were particularly unusual favorites of his. Jeff even told the family that if they were kind to him, he would bring them good luck. Could some sort of fae creature have taken the form of a mongoose and moved in with the family? Could the family have kept it around by without realizing it, leaving offerings to the creature. There are plenty of people who share Harry Price's private opinion that the whole thing was a hoax. Many believe that the initial noises made by Jeff and his speaking voice that came later were made by Vore. Skeptics say that Vore may have been a natural and immensely talented ventriloquist, with not only the ability to change her voice entirely, but also to throw it so that it sounded like it was coming from a different location entirely. Is this a talent that Vore could have discovered in her isolation? and attempted to use it to give her parents some entertainment in their equally as dull lives? Was it all just one big joke that got seriously out of hand? Did Margaret and James find out it was a hoax, but just played along for attention and a break in their monotonous existence? 
If ventriloquism is a culprit, what of those who claim to have seen Jeff? Jeff, annoyingly, would only appear to those who believed in him. This is why he ignored Harry Price during his visit. Jeff only appeared to believers is a very convenient excuse as to why no investigators could ever get any proof of his existence. Skeptics point towards this as being evidence of Jeff being a hoax. Those who have claimed to have seen Jeff have been accused of only seeing what they wanted to see. If someone went into the Irving house, already believing that a talking mongoose was living there, they could be so desperate to catch a glimpse of one that their minds could trick them into seeing just that. Could sightings of Jeff had just been a type of mass hysteria? The loneliness and isolation of the Irving family may be the true cause of the existence of Jeff, but not in the form of a hoax. Could the family have been so bored that they simply willed the entertaining Jeff into existence by accident using their latent psychic energy? This may sound far-fetched, but the concept of a thought form energy ghost, or a tulpa, is not a new one. It's part of the Buddhist religion, a common concept in the occult, and has even been investigated by scientists. A point of debate is if you can create a tulpa by accident. If you can, could the Irvings have simply willed a small, furry, talking animal into existence to give them some entertainment without even knowing they were doing it? As more and more people started coming to the farmhouse, could Jeff have just faded back into non-existence? Whether you believe that Jeff was some sort of fade trickster spirit, a secret ventriloquist joke, or a tulpa, this mongoose has gone down in history as one of the strangest stories of modern times. For such a ridiculous story, the public really got invested in it. People traveled for days to visit the Irving family farmhouse in the hopes of hearing or seeing the mongoose. But why did Jeff capture the public imagination so? James Irving summed it up when he said, No one would invent such a bloody, silly story. In other words, Jeff was simply too weird to be fake. Well, y'all, that's all for this week. Hopefully you enjoyed those three stories from Martin R. Shaw's book, Too Weird to be Fake. Go check out this book and others by Martin R. Shaw on Amazon, Kindle, BarnesandNoble.com, and wherever fine books are sold. Grab yourself a copy, read the rest of these Too Weird to be Fake stories, and we will see you next time on Strange Chapters. Y'all stay safe out there and stay strange. <laughs>